Sorry, boy. But his captain's got to teach his men what happens to those while crossing. Captain's got to teach stuff. <laughs> Good morning from the Bat Cave. It is uh, Tuesday, um, June 18th, 2024, and I am going to be continuing in Joshua. Um, I do have some other things that I've been working on. I'm going to try to do a, just a plain Bible study once a week, like I've been telling you guys. Um, but I am working on uh, the history of Zoroastrianism and where that connects back to what I believe to be the original false religion at Babel, um, led by Canaan, who was the son of our Faxad. Um, and, uh, and then I'm going to do an expose on this uh, Book of Jubilees and uh, guys who support it as if it's legit. Um, there's probably some bits of true information in it but it is definitely a fraud it's i mean it's very clear propaganda when you read it and it's uh contradicts genesis in dozens and dozens of places i i stopped keeping track after probably like 20 places where it very clearly contradicts the book of genesis so um i'm gonna i'm gonna do an expose on that and then on guys like ken johnson and this other guy sean something who who thinks it should be in the canon he's always on standing for truth um, I, I think these guys um, have reached a point where I've, I've listened to Ken Johnson for years. I think it's a point where people need to call him out because the comments are always disabled on his show. And he is constantly giving misinformation and telling you things support a pre-trib rapture when they absolutely don't. He won't read those documents to you. He just keeps telling you, like, he says the Didache very clearly in three places supports the pre-trib rapture. It's just not true. And he... He's way too well read to just be doing what he's doing out of ignorance, and I'm gonna call it out as he's just lying. So, um, anyways, I'm gonna try to do that later this week. I'll probably do, um, I'll probably do the Zoroastrian stuff this this um, later this week, and then next week I'll do the Book of Jubilee stuff with that because I want to do more homework just to kind of demonstrate the errors and demonstrate um, clearly how the Book of Jubilees cannot be a legitimate book that. Even even somebody considers Deuterocanon to the Old Testament, it should just be considered made up propaganda. So, um, which with a probably a few a few details of extra biblical fact in there that um, might be helpful, but that's about it. So, um, so anyways, uh, we're gonna go to uh, Joshua, and I think we're gonna try to do probably about ten chapters here. So, if you remember the first um, section we just did, kind of led us up to. Um, Joshua uh, basically leading everybody in to take Jericho, which they did successfully. Rahab helped the two witnesses spy out the land. The two witnesses helped Rahab's family get um, pulled out of um, Jericho before it was destroyed. And that was kind of a, a type of the church being pulled out after the seven trumpets. Um, and then we're going to get into the next section. If you remember, Achor, um, Achor took some stuff he wasn't supposed to take from Jericho and uh, caused Israel to be under a curse because of that. And um, they go to their next fight to AI and they get their butts kicked because they were under curse because of him breaking the Lord's command. And uh, they use Urim and Thummim to figure out who did it. And he eventually confesses and him and his whole family are um, stoned to death and then burned with stones. So that's how they remove the evil out of the camp. And just so you guys know, when you're dealing with things like that, people getting stoned to death, you want to think of that as a four type of church discipline, okay? In the case of church discipline, it's not that we're trying to permanently eradicate these people or kill them. We're trying to force them into repentance, okay? The understanding is that we know they have the Holy Spirit in them, or we assume they have the Holy Spirit in them. And if we reject them from fellowship, the Holy Spirit is going to convict them that it's their fault and it's because of sin. And um, basically, they're eventually going to repent from the sin. But you do this, you don't do this over denominational doctrine. You don't do this over, you know, extra biblical rules. Like, I don't think people should dance or play cards. I don't think people should smoke. Um, I don't think people should drink. You do it over things the Bible specifically says, like fornication, covetousness, um, um, railing. So people who are always like maybe violent and getting into conflicts with people or screaming at people um, or... Um, railing against the government that could be one um or people who are uh drunkards so not someone who drinks somebody who gets drunk and uh doesn't know how to like alcoholics basically somebody who doesn't know how to hold their stuff and doesn't know how to moderate how much they drink 
Um, these are people where you confront them biblically, and if they don't repent, you put them out of the camp, and you treat it like they would treat leprosy. Um, and basically, it's like when when the leprosy is gone, they can come back into the camp. Okay, that's that's kind of one metaphor. The stoning to death is about you know all the people um, taking part in it. So it's something that's done by the whole class of people who are God's people. In other words, it's like a body of the Christ doing it versus just these people who have it out for you. So it never gets labeled as a political thing. It's a clear thing that here's why we're disciplining you. And this is why it's important. Like you, it's, it's unbiblical for you to be in a situation where, let's say, a pastor asks you to leave the church. And it's like, I'm sorry, but like, are you going to take me through a church discipline process and the whole church is going to do that? Or are you just doing it? Okay, because churches will do stuff like this. They'll be like, well, you know, you know, you offended us. I don't want you to come back. And it's like, well, um, that's not biblical. If I'm being uh, if you're offended because I've sinned, well, then you need to expose my sin to the whole church. You need to go through a biblical process of calling me to repentance first. And if I don't repent by two or three witnesses, then telling it to the whole church and the whole church is throwing me out. You can't just call somebody because you don't just like them and you throw them out. Of course, most churches aren't real churches anymore. They're like little clubhouses and pastor cults where this guy just thinks he just, it's his church. He literally calls it his church. And if I don't want you to come here, I'm just telling you not to come here. Okay. Um, I've called pastors out on this stuff. You know, I've had people like, oh, oh, you speak against us claiming everybody can raise the dead or the preacher of rapture or whatever. And it's just like, you know, over over issues that are not biblical issues, and then they just make it a personal like this is you know this is my little guys with Napoleon complexes making it my personal. I can tell you unilaterally don't come back here, and unfortunately because um, there's just a lot of weak people who are in churches and not a lot of lot, a lot of people who would really qualify as elders. Um, they just follow the pastor and they don't you know the other elders are meant to keep. A pastor is supposed to be one of several equal elders, and he might be the main teaching pastor if he's got a gift of teaching, but he's not meant to be over the other elders. And this is this is why you have a lot of churches de facto having bishops and elders, where they won't say they do, um, but you, you literally can have, like, I've been in Baptist churches where there's just one pastor and the rest are just deacons. You know, well, that's no different than having a bishop and elders, I mean, and they function exactly like bishops and elders, like a, like a Catholic system. And you're never supposed to have a church that is headed by one man who can unilaterally execute church discipline without a process, okay? It's supposed to be something that's done by the whole congregation so that you understand we're doing this in obedience to Christ, not because you had a personal conflict with the pastor or some big donor in the church, okay? Because that's literally what happens all over the country, okay? So, um... So anyways, we're in Joshua, and then um, what we're going to do is chapter 10 is going to get down to them going back at Ai now after the uh, the wickedness is put out of the camp, and then they're going to um, kind of march forward, and they're going to have, like I think, two or three major battles left. I think there's two more left. So, so we're going back to chapter 8. I think I just did up to chapter 7 before. So chapter 8, the Lord's going to encourage them to go back and take Ai, and then they're going to go uh, uh, basically get Gibeon to help them, or we'll get into it. Okay. So the Lord said to Joshua, Fear not, neither be thou dismayed. Um, take all the people of war with thee. Arise and go up to Ai. And I have uh, given into thy hand the king of Ai and his people in the, in, in the city of this land. And thou shalt do to Ai and all her kings as thou didst Jericho and her kings, only the spoil thereof, the cattle thereof, Shall you take for prey unto yourselves, uh, lay thee in ambush for the city behind it. So the second city, they're allowed to take all the cattle and stuff. And you heard my reason. I think Jericho is kind of foretyping um, Jerusalem in the last days. And that's why they're not allowed to take anything from it. Because it, um, the Lord is saying it. all this stuff belongs to the Lord. So, so it says, so Joshua rose and all the people of war to go up against Ai. And, and Joshua chose uh, out 30 men out of valor and sent them away by night. And he uh, commanded them, saying, Behold, I shall live and wait against the city, even behind the city, and not, or go not very far from the city, and be ye all ready. And I and all the people that are with me will approach the city, and when it shall come to pass, when they shall come out against us as at the first, that we will flee from them, for they will come out after us till we have drawn them out of the city. And I say they will flee for, before us as the first, 
Therefore, we will flee from them. Then you'll um, rise up from the ambush and seize upon the city, and the Lord will deliver you, delivered into your hand. And it shall be that when you have taken the city, you shall set the city on fire according to the command of the Lord. You shall do see I have commanded you. So this is kind of a really good example of the Lord taking a human mistake and then kind of turning it into um, a, a an opportunity. Okay, um, the Lord does this in our lives. We can screw up and disobey the Lord, and then when we finally repent, God can go take the thing that we did wrong. Like I I believe God didn't want me to go to law school, but I went to law school because I was uh, in a relationship with somebody, and the economy was really bad, and I wanted to get married, and I thought, well, this is what I should do, and. Well, God was able to use that training I got in law school, both for my theological training and for um, my technical recruiting work that made me really good and efficient at it and allowed me to make a bunch of money, even though I had made a mistake and disobeyed the Lord. And, or really, I mean, I really had put it down and kind of put down that law school scholarship too, um, because I felt called to teach the word instead. And, um, you know, it's you, you kind of can go around the block and the Lord can eventually use that thing. Well, that's what he does with them. So... He knows that last time they chased him out and kicked their butts. And so they come back and they're like, act like they're kicking your butts again and then get them all out of the city and then kick their butts. Okay. So he says, Joshua therefore sent forth and they went to lie in ambush in a bow between Bethel and Ai in the west side of Ai. And Joshua lodged that, that night among the people. And Joshua rose up in the morning and numbered the people and went up. He and all the elders of Israel to the people of Ai and all the people, uh, even all the people that were with him went up, drew nigh, and came before the city, and pitched on the north side of Ai, and there was a valley between them and Ai, and they took about 5,000 men and sent them to in an ambush between Bethel and Ai on the west side of the city. So just so you know, this is Bethel. This is going to be kind of the southern major city of northern Israel when it splits, and that's going to be where one of the golden calves are. So um, they're pretty close to that region. <laughs> Let's actually see if we can find that on a map. So you see this map here, you've got Bethel and Ai pretty close here. Um, they just came up from uh, Jericho, which is, I think, down here, right around here. And then they're they're going inland now to Gibeon. Um, Jebus is really going to be Jerusalem. That's what they used to call the Jebusites. Um, the Bible calls it Jerusalem because it's later named that, but um, apparently they call it Jebus. So he says, when he sent the people, even the host that was in the north of the city and all their liars on wait to the west of the city, Joshua went that night to the midst of the valley. And it came to pass when the king of Ai saw it, that they hasted up and rose early and the men of the city went out against Israel to battle. He and all his people at a time appointed before the plain, but he wist not that there were liars in the ambush. Uh, in other words, he didn't consider that there were um, people getting ready to ambush him, uh, ambush him beside the city. And Joshua and all of Israel made it as if they were beaten before them and fled by the way of the wilderness. And all the people that were in Ai were called together to pursue after them, and they pursued after Joshua and were drawn away from the city. And there was not a man left in Ai or Bethel that went out after Israel, and they left the city open and pursued after Israel. And the Lord said to Joshua, Stretch out the spear of thy hand towards Ai, for I will give it into thy hand. And Joshua stretched out the spear that he had in his hand towards the city. And the ambush arose quick, quickly out of their place, and they ran as soon as they had stretched out his hand, and they entered in the city and took it, and hasted and set the city on fire. And when the men of, and when the men of Ai looked behind him, they saw and behold the smoke of the city ascended up to heaven. And they had no, they had no power to flee this way or that way. And the people fled to the wilderness and turned back on their pursuers. And when Joshua and all Israel saw that the ambush had taken the city and that the smoke of the city ascended, they turned again and slew the men of Ai. Another, another issued out of the city against them, so that they were in the midst of Israel, some on this side and some on that side. They smote them, and that they let none there escape. And the king of Ai they took alive and brought him to Joshua. And it came to pass when Israel had made an end of slaying all the inhabitants of Ai in the field that the, in the wilderness, wherein they chased them, and wherein they are fallen by the edge of the sword until they were consumed, that all the Israelites returned to Ai and smote, smote it with the edge of the sword. And so it was that all that fell on that day, both men and women, were twelve thousand, even all the men of Ai. For Joshua drew not back his hand, wherein he stretched out the spear until he had uttered, utterly destroyed the inhabitants of Ai. Only the cattle and the spoil of the city Israel took for prey unto themselves, according to the word of the Lord, when he commanded Joshua. And Joshua burnt Ai and made it a heap forever and a desolation even to this day. So it doesn't really get into specifically why certain cities are made to be a complete desolation and not just sacked and taken and used for them. 
Um, it could be like these are cities that were particularly wicked. Um, maybe they were centers of occult worship or something like that. But it doesn't really say. And then it says, The king of Ai hanged on the tree until eventide. And as soon as the sun was down, Joshua commanded that they should take his carcass down from the tree and cast it at the entering of the gate of the city and raise there on a great heap of stones that there that remains to this day. So this could just be there as like a testimony of them coming in and the power of the Lord and taking the land. I don't know. Uh, then Joshua built an altar unto the Lord of Lord God of Israel on Mount Ebal, and Moses, the serv- as Moses the servant of the Lord, commanded the children of Israel, as written in the book of Moses, an altar of whole stones in which no man lifted up any any uh, iron, and offered the burnt offering to the Lord and the sacrifice and the peace offerings. So remember how w- he, Moses told them when they go in the land, they're going to um, get on these two uh, mountains and they're going to do the blessings and cursing. And they have to stand up on Mount Ebal as one of the mountains and Mount Gerizim as the other. So, um, let's see. And he wrote upon the stones a copy of the law of Moses, which he wrote in the presence of Israel. So, I would assume this is the Ten Commandments. I would assume that's the law that they're writing on these stones. I don't think they're copying the whole um, book of the law. Or, okay. So, then it says, of, the, of, the, of all Israel and their elders and their officers and their judges stood on this side of the ark, and on that side before the priests and the Levites, which bear the Ark of the Covenant before the Lord, as well as the stranger, and he was that was born among them, half of them over against Mount Gerizim, and half of them over against Mount Ebal, as the servant of the Lord had commanded the day before that they should bless the people of Israel. And afterward he read the words of the law, and blessing with the cursing, according to all that was written in the book of the law, and there was not a word of all that Moses commanded, which Joshua read not before the congregation of Israel, with the women, the little ones, and the strangers that were covenant among them. And it came to pass when all these, all the kings which were on the side of the Jordan and the hills and the valleys and all the coasts and the great sea over against Lebanon, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, the Jebusite uh, heard thereof, they gathered themselves together to fight with Joshua and Israel with one accord. And when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard Joshua done uh, unto Jericho and Ai, they did work wilily, and they uh, made as if they had been ambassadors, and they uh, took old sacks upon their asses, um, and wine bottles, and old and rent and bound up, and old shoes and clouded them on their feet, and old garments upon them, and the bread of their provisions was dry and moldy. And they went to Joshua unto the camp of Gogol, and said unto him, uh, to the men of Israel, We come from a far country, now therefore make ye a league with us. Uh, and the men of Israel said to the Hivites, Peradventure you dwell among us, uh, how do we know, uh, shall we make a, meet, a league with you? And they said to Joshua, We are thy servants. And Joshua said, Who are you? And where do you come from? And they said unto him, From a far country thy servants have come, because of the name of the Lord thy God. For we have heard the fame of him and all that he did in Egypt, and all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites that were beyond the Jordan, and Sihon the king of Heshbon, and Oz the king of Bashan, which was at Ashtaroth. Now remember, Yahweh the Lord, okay? You're saying, they've, We've heard that the Lord your God is with you. It's, it's not like this, this, this God is unknown to anyone but Israel. This God apparently was known to have dwelt in Edom before they got there around Basra. And he goes up from Edom to Mount Sinai when they get to Mount Sinai. Okay, So this is the God of the storm. And some people are going to call this God Baal. Um, but the reality is, is it is Yahweh. Now, probably they're not calling him Yahweh. Because Moses just gets the name Yahweh or Yahovah or however you pronounce it, um, he says um, in in the burning bush. So it's not likely that they're calling him by that name. There, but but whoever's recording this is saying we know who this guy is. Now maybe they are spreading around the name of Yehovah by this time. But since the Jews have this tradition that it's like a sacred name and you're not supposed to like say the name because you could take the name in vain. It's not likely that everyone's running around saying, Yehovah, 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 blah, 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 this and that, Yehovah, all around, okay? So whoever this, you know, whether it's the generic Lord and they're just putting in Yehovah when they're writing this, other people know who this God is because this God has been around since the days of Job. And it's this God of the storm who shows up in a whirlwind and he blesses Job. And Job was like a prominent king in the land until probably around 100 years before um, the Jews came out of Egypt, okay? So it's not like this is like so ancient times that nobody knows who this is. It's just like that that God is active again, and he is fighting on behalf of, of these Jews. And so they're going around, kicking butt all around, and apparently that God is left off of um, 
you know, um, basically protecting Job's descendants who are not running. They're not the king of Seir anymore. And then they're now uh, hanging around with Israel and he's having them get victory over their, over their enemies. Okay. So he says, um, and all that he did to the kings of the Amorites were bound in Jordan, Sihon, king of Heshbon, Og, king of Bashan, which was at Ashtaroth. Remember, Ashtaroth is where Ashtra was and uh, apparently was sleeping with angels to make the Nephilim again. And Og, king of Bashan, is Nephilim. Okay. And he seems to be the the heir of the OG. At, that's what I'd imagine if he's at Ashtaroth. He's the heir um, of the first... Um, Nephilim, son of Ashtra. That's that's who I would imagine he is. And Ashtra, Ish, Ishtar, or Inanna of the Sumerians, it's the same person, okay? Um, Wherefore our elders and the inhabitants of our country spoke to us, saying, Take victuals with you for the journey, and go to meet them, and say to them, We are your servants, therefore you make a league now with us. This is our bread, which we uh, took hot for our provisions out of the houses in the day that we have came forth unto you. But now, behold, it is dry and it is moldy, and these bottles of wine which were filled were new. And behold, they be rent, and these are garments in our shoe, uh, are old by the reason of the long journey. So they're making it look like all their stuff's worn out because they've been traveling for weeks or months or however long to get to them, right? And the men took their victuals and asked not counsel out of the mouth of the Lord. This was the dumb thing. They ask not counsel of the mouth of the Lord, okay? These people are asking you to make a league with them. In other words, make a covenant with them. Make an alliance with them to be frenemies, okay? Um, so Joshua made peace with them and made a league with them to let them live. And the princes of the congregation swore unto them, okay? So they just did something dumb here, okay? Now it's going to be important because the city where they do it is Gibeah. Gibeah. This is Gibeah right here. The next city over, see how... See how you got the road to it? It's literally the next town over. Here's Gibeah, and if you're the, you know, this this road goes um, up and down between Jerusalem and Bethel. So that's a pretty main highway. Okay. Now remember, they just took Ai, um, and then Ai, and they're over against Bethel. Okay, and they've basically are setting them up. I don't know where Mount Ebal and Mount um, whatever are, but they're right around here. And Gibeah is just right up the road from them. So this is probably, I'm going to guess this is like 10 to 20 miles away. It's not that far. So Bethel to Jerusalem, you see this is the two mile distance here. So you got Jerusalem to Kirbet Bethel. That's Bethel right here. It's only like five, six miles to Jerusalem. Okay. So this town that they were at then is... You see Bethlehem right here, Jebus is Jerusalem, and Gibeah right here. If here to here is five, six miles, this is like three or four miles away. They're from a, they're from a city that's like three or four miles away, and they've got these guys duped into thinking they're from a long journey. Now, this is just really dumb on their part, okay? But I want, I want you to pay attention here. Here's Gibeah. Here's the city that they're going to spare. And when you get into the Book of Judges, here's Gibeon. Now, Gibeon is going to be the city. It's literally the next town over on this road. You see, you would you would go, if you're going east to west from here, if you're going uh, south, you're going to get to Jerusalem. If you're going to go north, you could go to Geba, or you could go to a couple of cities right here. But if you're going west, the next town over is Gibeon, okay? And this is important. The Benjamites are going to dwell around here. And Gibeon is going to be the city where um, this is literally... Um, the next priest down the line, by that time, they're going to have this city so corrupted that people are raping people in the streets like Sodom and Gomorrah, and they rape a woman to death, okay? And then that, and that's the guy who chops up his bride down the road. So this city who's duping them is, I mean, Gibeah and Gibeon, um, they're probably related. They're probably people who are related to each other before. And since these guys um, basically made a league with them, if they've got relatives down here, or if they're just down the road, who do you think they're intermarrying with? Who do you think they're you know, picking up girls with, right? So you're gonna have these people mix in with the Benjamites right here, and within one generation, they're going to be a bunch of Sodomites, basically. So um, just want you to see like how quickly this is gonna turn over, because that, that story's in the end of the Book of Judges, but it's actually Aaron's grandson who's the high priest when it happens. So it's probably at the most like 50, 60 years away, okay? So, 
So it came to pass at the end of three days that they made a league with them that they heard that they were neighbors and they dwelt among them. So they realized, crap, these people are from right here. And the children of Israel journeyed and they came to their cities on the third day. And now their cities were Gibeon, Shepharah, Beeroth, and Kirath Jerem. Okay, so they have four cities. So let's see. Uh, Gibeon, there's Kirath Jerem, there's Beeroth. What's the fourth one? And Shephirah. I don't see where Shephirah is, but Kirith Jerem, Gibeah, Gibeon, they're surrounding that city of Gibeon. Okay? So the Benjamites are going to dwell in the city of Gibeon, but they're surrounded by these Canaanites. And these Canaanites are basically going to corrupt and pervert their city almost immediately afterwards. Okay? Um, so then it says, The children of Israel smote them not, because the princes of the congregation had sworn to them by the Lord of Israel. And the congregation murmured against the princes. What are you doing making a deal with these guys? We're not supposed to make a deal with these guys. These are the bad guys, remember? Um, and so he says, but, but the princes said in the congregation, We have swore to them by the Lord God of Israel. Now we may not touch them. Remember, they are obligated to keep their vows unto the Lord. And this is very important, okay? Because when you get into people forcing people to divorce their wives, their precedent is you weren't supposed to do that, but now you made a vow unto the Lord so you don't undo your vow to the Lord, okay? This is their precedent, and this long predates any anything that Ezra and Nehemiah come up with, okay? It's Ezra and Nehemiah who are going to twist scriptures, they're gonna go way overboard on who they're not supposed to marry, and then they're going to say, break your vow in order to um, keep the law to not marry Gentiles, okay? That's not the law, and by the time you get to the Book of Jubilees, they're claiming that it was a law of all time from the time of Abraham not to marry Gentiles. And that's just not true. You have, um, I mean, basically, if Abraham is called out, everyone Abraham is marrying is technically a Gentile, if the Jews start with Abraham. Now, there were things about not liking these Canaanites and his wife not, or uh, Isaac's wife not liking the Canaanite women that Esau marries, and they wanted to get descendants from their relatives, and Abraham basically saying, don't take a son for Isaac out of the Canaanites because they did not like the Canaanites and they didn't trust the Canaanites and Abraham knew by the Lord that these people are going to keep getting worse okay he knows that God's going to send them out to eventually take over their land but their sin is not full yet but he knows they're going to keep getting worse okay so there's a specific thing about not marrying in with the Canaanites in general that they're trying to avoid but Judah marries a Canaanite um, Rahab is a Canaanite. They're going to marry. She's going to marry, and you're going. They're going to marry Moabites. They're going to marry Egyptians. They're going to marry Babylonians, and all these people. And none of this is forbidden. Okay, the only thing that's forbidden is when they're going up to conquer the land. They are not supposed to uh, give their sons and daughters as wives to the Canaanites because they're supposed to drive them out of the land or wipe them out. Okay, they're they're basically called to genocide them. Okay. Um, and what what um, he's telling them is don't make a, the the reason they're not supposed to marry in with them is because they're not supposed to make a league with them. Okay, this is the exact thing they're trying to avoid. Okay, but they do make a league with them, and when they do make a league with them, what does the Lord tell them to do about it? Okay, this is your legal precedent of how you deal with somebody. Let's say they weren't supposed to marry Canaan. Well, what happens if they do? Sorry, I was poor. This is the only wife I could find. Okay, should, should should he divorce her? No, he's made a vow before the Lord to marry her and love her till death do you part. Okay, so what is the precedent? And he says, the princess said unto them, let them live, but the, uh, let them be hewers of wood and drawers of water into the congregation as the princess have promised them. Um, And Joshua called them and spoke to them, Wherefore have you beguiled us, saying, We are very far from you, and when you dwell among us, therefore, uh, now therefore you are cursed, and none of you shall be freed from being bondmen, and here is a wooden drawers of water for the house of, of God. Okay? And they answered Joshua and says, Because it was certainly told thy servants how the Lord thy God commanded thy servant Moses to give you all the land and to destroy all the inhabitants from before you. Therefore we are sore afraid of our lives because of you and had done this thing. So I want you to show you also what's happening here. They're kind of doing it in faith. Okay? They're like, yes, we deceived you, but that's because we believe you're going to destroy us because your God is God. Okay? 
So there's kind of a repentance going on, okay? And now, behold, we are in thy hand, as it seems good and right to do unto us. And so uh, he did unto them, delivered them out of the hand of the children of Israel, and they slew them not. And Joshua made them hewers of wood and drawers of water for the congregation, for the altar of the Lord, even to this day, unto a place where they, sh they should choose, okay? Now there's going to be a later thing in the book of Samuel where it talks about David put these guys to axes and... Um, saws or whatever and it's not he's not saying he sawed them in two and chopped them with axes he's saying he put them to work with axes and this as tributaries okay so tributaries are not just handing you over cash all the time you you're, there's a lot of just trade going on not everyone's cash heavy okay um not everybody a lot of these people just have a trade craft okay and so they don't have um access to just make a pile of chains sitting around that you can tax, okay? And so what they're able to do is, well, you can go hew stone and you can go chop wood, okay? And so that's what they're going to do is they're going to make these guys, just just like the Egyptians made them make a, a, a quota of bricks out of clay and straw, you have to craft these bricks and anyone with mud and straw can do it. Um, he's saying we, we've got a lot of rock and we've got a lot of... Um, We've got a lot of wood, and so you guys are going to be hewers of wood and drawers of water, okay? So in other words, um, when <coughs> it's interesting he says, for the house of my God, because they don't really have a house of God. Maybe that's just the tabernacle. But obviously the priesthood needs wood for the fire all the time, and uh, they need water for all the washing they've got to be doing and just for the priesthood, okay? So he's basically saying you guys uh, need to do this. Get your daughters to go get jugs of water and bring them to us, and uh, you guys need to use a certain amount of wood and bring it to us. That's your tribute, okay? And that would be commonly how tribute was done, especially when it's local like that, okay? It's like, what's something that we need done service-wise that you can do? So you got your regular job, but every weekend, guess what? Your Saturdays, maybe not, maybe not the Sabbath, so maybe it's Sunday, but your day off, you're spending chopping wood for us. You're our servant. That's your tax, okay? So um, it doesn't say. I thought. I thought the. I thought he. Um, see, the princess said, "Let them live." Um, it doesn't say that they count. They took counsel with the Lord to uh, let these people live, and I thought they did. So maybe I had said that mistakenly in another video. I thought they had actually consulted with the Lord, and the Lord said, "Keep your word." Um, they didn't. But you have two conflicting laws here. One is you keep your vows unto the Lord. The other one is don't marry the Canaanites. Okay, well, they deceived us into marrying them. What do we do? Well, we made a vow unto the Lord. So they apparently treat the vow unto the Lord as more important than the command not to make leagues with these guys. Okay, and they allow them to live because of that. And this is what the Lord is going to call out as precedent through the prophet Malachi when they're divorcing their wives. He's going to say, the Lord was there when you made your vow. So you pay your vows unto the Lord. And then in the new covenant, Jesus is going to say, don't make vows unto the Lord. That's how you get yourself in trouble. Don't make vows unto the Lord. Just let your yes be yes and your no be no. Okay. Now, if they just said, yeah, we'll let you live without making a vow unto the Lord. And then they found out they lied to him. Then we could just say, I said yes, because you lied to me. Okay. You said you're from a far country when you were right up the stroke. You were stones throw distance away you're right up the road and you lied to me okay so deals off but you gave you no i just said yes so that's why you gotta be careful you gotta be careful with contracting man people get you in trouble read the fine print so when it came to pass when adonai zedek the king of jerusalem had heard how joshua had taken ai and utterly destroyed it that he had done to jericho and her king and so that he had made done to Ai and her king, and now the inhabitants of Gideon had made peace of Israel and were among them, and they feared greatly, because Gibeon was a great city and one of the royal cities, and it was greater than Ai, and all the men were mighty, okay? So apparently this Gibeon, oh, I'm sorry, this is Gibeon, this is Gibeon, I made, made a mistake on which is which, okay? So it's this Kirith, Jerem, Baroth, uh, Gibeon, and the next street over on the road to Jerusalem. So this is going to be the main road, the next street over. Like if they were like out here, these are their villages and they're like, we're going into town. Gibeah would be the one that they go into town at. Okay. Um, so this is where the Benjamites dwell and this is where they dwell. And so they're going to corrupt that city. Okay. Now, um, he said they feared greatly because Gibeon was a great city, one of the royal cities, and it was greater than Ai and men were ever mighty. So 
whoever this royal city is, whoever these Gibeonites are, um, they're descendants of Canaan and their aristocracy among them, okay? Um, and now you have Jebus, okay, Jerusalem is Jebus, Adonai Zedek, remember Melchizedek, um, this used to be called Salem, and, and uh, Adonai Zedek um, is basically the um, political heir of Melchizedek. This is probably not a descendant of Melchizedek, because I believe Melchizedek was uh, Shem, and he was pushed out. And I believe Hebron was Heber, and Heber was pushed out. And they're eventually going to go up north, and they're going to die just south of the Golan. That's where they're going to be buried, okay? Um, and what I believe is these are the Jebusites who pushed them out, and they, they took over, but they kept the title Zedek, because Adonai Zedek literally means um, king or lord of righteousness, okay? Zedek means righteousness. Melchizedek, Melek means king. So Melchizedek is king of righteousness. Adonai Zedek is lord of righteousness, okay? So he, this guy is a type of the Antichrist. Remember, this this campaign is kind of a type of um, Jesus's campaign to, to take over Israel in the last days. And he's going to go start by splitting the mountain, and then he's going to go down Basra and kick everyone's butt, and then he's going to come into the land, and he's going to head up, and he's going to um, take the king of Jerusalem, okay? Which is the Antichrist in the last day. So this guy who's calling himself the Lord of right Righteousness, remember Melchizedek is a type of Christ, and now Adonai Zedek is a type of Antichrist, okay? And so um, he sees how he had taken AI, and this is just, this is just me. This is not... I'm not claiming this is knowing the thing, but it's interesting how they, they take AI before they take Adonai Zedek. I just have a feeling like AI, like this is not a mistake, like in the, that we're calling artificial intelligence AI, that this unknown God that's being created right now is, is called AI because they take out AI right before they take out the king, the this type of Antichrist, okay? So maybe that's what happens is like, let... I, this is this is how, kind of how I theorize it is like whatever the data center is that becomes um, the house of the AI that's running the world and the mark of the beast and all that stuff. I think it's going to be at Neon, and I think when they destroy Neon right before that, that sets loose the world from the AI. You know, whatever they probably got something with drones or whatever that is forcing people who don't worship the beast and take the mark and all that stuff to die. Okay. And when they take out Neon, that takes out their data center. And because because they're moving like all the um, all the um, semiconductor manufacturing that's being done in Taiwan right now, they're moving it to Phoenix and apparently Saudi Arabia is the other one. Um, not Phoenix, Phoenix, not just Phoenix. I think Columbus, Ohio is getting some. Um, Intel basically is getting it, and and then uh, Saudi Arabia got big contracts for it. And I have a feeling that Neom is going to become this mega data tech center uh, location. It's going to replace Silicon Valley after California gets nuked. That's that's my opinion. And then I think they're going to collab with the Tel Aviv um, people because I think um, probably the Jews are going to get super uh, religious and go conservative. And what you're going to have is all the, because I mean, they, Jews have their own Silicon Valley in Tel Aviv with a, with a very similar culture to San Francisco. And I think all those people are probably going to move to Neom and it's just going to become the new Silicon Valley of the world. Okay. Um, and they're going to have lots of semiconductor manufacturing, probably lots of computer programming and a lot of just, just AI junk going on there. Um, so it's just interesting that AI gets taken and then here comes Jerusalem because Neom basically gets destroyed leading up to um, the capture of the Antichrist and then the defeat of the armies at Megiddo, which is going to be their last battle, is going to be north, okay? So it says um, that they fe feared greatly because Gibeon was a great city and city one of the royal cities. Okay, then he says, Wherefore Adonai Zedek, the king of Jerusalem, sent to Hoham, the king of Hebron, and Piram, the king of Jarmuth, and Japhia, the king of Lachish. So remember, Lachish is, is going to become Dan. The Danites are going to take it. Um, and Debir, the king of Eglon. So, so this is Eglon is going to be among the Philistines. Um, Hebron obviously is going to be part of where Judah is. He's in Jerusalem. Lachish is going to be all the way to the north. And Debir is, uh, or I'm sorry, Piram, the king of Jarmuth. I don't know where Jarmuth is. So Eglon is apparently in the south of Judah too. Okay, so all the all the kings that are coming against him, it looks like they're all 
in, in the land of Judea, okay? So then he says, come up with me that we may smite Gibeon because it has made peace with Joshua and the children of Israel. So they're not after um, the Israelites yet. They're after Gibeon. They're going to take Gibeon out because Gibeon, remember, is these three or four cities that um, basically are right up in their midst. And now they're allies, essentially. They're tributaries, which means they can call them out to fight too, okay, um, with Joshua and those guys. And the men of Gibeon sent to Joshua in the camp of Gil Gilgal, saying, Slack not thy hand from thy servants. Come up quickly and save us and help us, for the kings of the Amorites that dwell in the mountains are gathered together against us. So, um, I don't. the Jebusites are a different tribe from the Amorites, so I don't know why they're calling them all the Amorites, and unless the Amorites are just clearly the dominant tribe over all of Canaan, and all the aristocracies and the kings are them, but the peoples might be Jebusites. Like, it's very likely that they are the dominant ones in uh, Canaan because um, the Hittites are mostly migrated out there to the north of there, all the way up into um, Turkey by this time. Um, and then the, the Sidonians are mostly seafaring people. So they seem to be the ones that control the hills and they, maybe they have the aristocracy that's there, okay? So anyways, so Joshua ascended uh, from Gilgal, and all the people went to war with him. The mighty men of valor and the Lord said to Joshua, Fear them not, for I have delivered them into thine hand, and there shall not be a man of them stand before thee. Joshua therefore came unto them suddenly and went up to Gilgal all night, and the Lord discomfited them before Israel and slew them with a great slaughter in Gibeon, and chased them all along the way that goeth up for Beth Horon, and smote them to Azekah and Makeda. Azekah and Makeda. Let's see where these places are. So basically they chased them out of the mountains towards the valley as you're heading towards, you see there's Gath right there and there's Lachish. Um, so basically they pushed them out of the mountains back down towards the Philistines. So that's what they really did is they took over the mountains, okay? Um, and the Danites are going to be around this area too, that Zenoa, I think that's our, where their camp is. So, so what they really did is they took the high ground. So once they have the high ground, if a Sith tries to jump and uh, lightsaber them, they're going to get their legs cut off. So it's good to get the high ground. Um, so anyways, they, they chased them downhill and they smote them and they pushed them and pushed them and pushed them until they went back to here and, and now we've got the mountains, okay? And it came to pass as they fled from before Israel and they were going down to Beth Horon, the Lord cast down great stones from heaven upon them in Azekah and they died. So the Lord is actually helping them take these people out down in Azeka. Okay? That's pretty cool. And uh, there were more that died with hailstones than whom the Israel, children of Israel slew with the sword. So the Lord's like, you know, letting them help, basically. He's like, it's like it's like when you're dead, when you're a little kid, and you're like, you want to help me lift this thing? And you're doing 90% of lifting, and your kid's like, Arr! and he feels all proud when he's done. Um, then spake Joshua the Lord in the day the Lord delivered up the Amorites and the children of Israel, and they said in the sight of Israel, Sun stand still upon, upon Gibeon and thou moon in the valley of Ajalon. Okay? Now this is a very big deal. Okay? Now your flat earth people are going to say, see, the sun's over here and the moon's over here because they're just these low hanging orbital balls that just circle above the earth. No, it's perspective, dude. It's like, okay, here's Ajalon. Where's Ajalon? And Gibeon. Here's Gibeon. And Ajalon is somebody else, okay? And they're down here. And literally, it's the sun's on one side of them and the moon's on the other side of them. In other words, the sun's going down. And when the sun's going down, sometimes you see the sun and the moon at the same time because one is rising as the other is setting. This is not rocket science, you guys. Actually, it is rocket science. It's how you figure out how to get to the moon without dying, okay? Now, you have the sun and the moon, and they're basically like the, you see the sun over Gibeon, you, or you see whatever. You see the sun over Gibeon, you see the moon over blah, 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 okay? Sun rises in the east, sets in the west. I don't know exactly how this goes. But the point is, is they're saying, stand still right there until we finish beating these guys. And it does. He says this in faith. He's a prophet, okay? If the sun stood still and the moon stayed and the people avenged themselves on their enemies. Is this not written in the book of Jasher, Okay. There was once upon a time a book of Jasher. And I believe this book, we don't have a record of it, but we know it's mentioned in Joshua. We know it's mentioned in um, 2 Samuel, which means it existed until the time of David. Now, this book of the righteous, 
I kind of have a theory that it might have started with because remember, um, um, king, the king of righteousness is if I if if that is Shem, I have a theory that this book existed from Shem to the time of uh, David, and when David was in Jerusalem and he was king, that era of the book of the righteous um, is kind of over, and it probably has a lot of stuff that overlaps with Genesis in it, and it probably has stuff that is. Um, in Joshua and all the way up to there and maybe the book of the wars of the Lord is part of it or maybe it's a separate book um, but the point is is what they have in the Middle Ages is not it that's a forgery that somebody made it up and called the book of Jasher because Jews tend to do stuff like that okay so um, is it not written in the book of Jasher apparently it is so the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and hastened not go down the whole day now, I know because the medieval book of Joshua, I think it just goes up to the days of Joshua, and, and, but there's stuff that's mentioned in um, Second Chronicles about how the Judahites taught um, their sons to use the bow in honor of Jonathan, okay, which is, he's obviously not born yet, okay? So there was no day like it before or after, and the Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man, uh, for, the, for the Lord fought for Israel. And Joshua returned and all Israel with him to the camp of Gilgal. Where is Gilgal? So there's Gibeon, there's Ajalon. Remember, they're chasing these people downhill, right? Down to Beth Horon and stuff, okay? So from where they're sitting, they're saying, sun stands still right there and moon stands still right there, okay? Now, I don't know if this is like in the morning because it seems like the sun's rising in the east and the moon's over here and maybe it just froze all day long from the morning time. And he basically said, sun stands still. So it's like morning time light. So it's not hot during the day. It's just the sun's just sitting over the horizon and it's and the moon's over here and they're somewhere down in here fighting and they're just like don't don't move until we're done um and then they go to gilgal so then they went back to their main camp which was outside of gilgal which is over here so they're still kind of camping here they've driven these guys out of the mountains um but apparently haven't gone through and slaughtered all their cities yet and their main army is camped right here okay remember they have a huge army and they're not sending all 600,000 of them everywhere they go. That's a big supply chain. They're staying close to the river where they can get all the water they need. And then they're sending out missions, basically. Okay? So, um... So he said, But these five kings fled and hid themselves in the cave of Makeda. Okay? Remember Makeda, where we showed you. Okay? And Joshua was saying, the kings of are found in the cave of Makeda. And Joshua says, roll great stones upon the mouth of the cave and set b men by it for to keep them. And stay ye not, but pursue after your enemies and smite the hindmost of them. Suffer them not to enter into their cities. For the Lord your God has delivered them into your hand. And it came to pass when Joshua and all the children of Israel had made an end of slaying them with a great, very great slaughter till they were consumed, that the rest which remained of them entered into fenced cities. And all the people returned to the camp of Joshua at Makeda in peace. None moved his his tongue against any of the children of Israel. So it seems like at this point, their camp of Gilgal, maybe I'm mistaken, um, the rest which remained of Israel or the rest which remained of, let's see, hold on. So it seems like they beat up on them and, until basically the rest of them are just running into their cities and essentially fortifying inside them to try not to die, okay? So they don't just go and kill every last person in every last place right away, um, but they take out the kings. Then he says, when they brought these kings out to Joshua, Joshua called for the men of Israel and said to the chiefs of the men of war, gone with them, come near and put your net feet in the necks of these kings. So they came near and they, George Floyded them. And, um, Joshua then said to them, Do not fear to be dismayed, be strong and courageous, and uh, thus the Lord will do to all your enemies with whom you fight. So afterward, Joshua struck them and put them to death, and he hanged them on five trees, and they hung on the trees until evening. Remember, they wouldn't, they'd take somebody down before evening, okay? And it came about at sunset that Joshua gave a command, and they took them down from the trees and threw them in the cave where, cave where they had hidden themselves and put large stones over the mouth of the cave to this day. I think that's kind of foretyping the kings that, you know, all the people that run underground to hide from the wrath of the Lamb. I think that these guys are foretyping them. Um, now Joshua captured Makeda on that day and struck it with his king in the edge of the sword, and he utterly destroyed it and every person that was in it, and he left no survivor. And he did to the king of Makeda just as he had done to the king of Jericho. Um, 
And Joshua and all of Israel with him passed from Makeda to Libna and fought against Libna. Now where's Libna? So now they're going to take the plain, basically. They're going down, see, Gat, once you get to Gath, you're in um, Philistine territory. And so they're really knocking down all these uh, Canaanites out of the land, okay? And the Lord gave it also with its king into the hands of Israel, and he struck it in every person with the edge of the sword, and he left no survivor in it. Thus he did to its king as he did to the king of Jericho. Uh, and Joshua and all Israel passed on from Libna to Lachish, and they camped by it and fought against it. Remember, that's one of the, the cities that they fled to. Um, and the Lord gave Lachish into the hands of Israel and captured it on the second day and struck it and every person with it to the edge of the sword, according to all they had done to Libna. And Horam, the king of Gezer, came up to help Lachish, and Joshua defeated him. Um, let's see. Where's Gezer? Um, Gezer is not... I think Gath is like the, the closest Philistine Philistine city. And I could be mistaken. Maybe maybe the Philistines are just on the coast, but I'm pretty sure Gath is one of, one of their cities. Um, I thought Goliath was from Gath. Yeah, Gath and Ek Ekron, I know, are Philistine cities. So... They're now taking out Gazer. See, they're taking all these cities in the plain pretty much right up to the Philistines' territory is what they're doing. Um, and that's going to be good farmland and stuff like that for them later. Uh, and Joshua defeated him and his people till he left no survivor. And Joshua and all of Israel passed on from Lachish to Eglon, and they fought by it and camped on it. I thought Eglon might be a Philistine city, but apparently it's not. And they captured it and struck with the edge of the sword, and they utterly destroyed uh, that day every person who was in it, according to all they had done to Lachish. So basically, all the cities where those armies fled to, that they were beaten, um, they took them all out and killed every last person. And then Joshua and all Israel with him went up from Eglon to Hebron, and they fought against it. Um, now Hebron, I think, has uh, Nephilim living up in there. And they captured it and struck it and its king, and all its cities, and all the persons that they were there with the edge of the sword, and they left no survivor according to all that he had done to Eglon, and they utterly destroyed every person who was in it. And Joshua and all of Israel returned to Debir, and they fought against it. So the main territories that they're going in and just cleaning out first are the territories that are ultimately going to go to um, the Judites and the Benjamites. Okay, um, They're going to get north of there pretty soon here, but that this is mostly southern Judea that they're conquering. Um, and then the land to the west of them is the, the Danites are going to camp in it, but they're supposed to go take down to the coast. They don't. The Danites are actually supposed to kind of clear out the Philistines, but they don't. Okay. Um, and he destroyed every person who was in it, left no survivor, just so he had done to Hebron. So did he and Debir and its king, and they had also done to Libna and its king. Thus Joshua struck all the land in the hill country, and the Negev, and the lowlands, and the slopes, and their kings, and left no survivor. But he utterly destroyed all who breathed, just as the Lord, the God of Israel, had commanded. And Joshua struck them from Kadesh Barnea, even as far as Gaza, and all the country of Goshen, as far as Gibeon. So I don't know if there's this, this is a different Goshen than Egypt's Goshen. Um, even of all the country of Goshen, as far as Gibeon. So it sounds like um, they would have kicked these guys. This has got to be a different Goshen. The land of Goshen by the Negev. Goshen, Holan, and Gilo. So yeah, it looks like it's a different Goshen than Goshen in Egypt. So Joshua captured all these kings of the lands at one time because the Lord of God had uh, of Israel fought for Israel. So Joshua and all Israel um, with him returned to the camp at Gogol. Now remember, Joshua's 90 when this is going down, Okay. And it came about when Jabin, the king of Hazor, heard it. Heard of it, he sent to Jobab, the king of Madon. So here's another king named Jobab, um, the king of Madon, and Shimron, the king of Akshaf. So Hazor is going to be in the north. Okay. So they re basically all of southern Israel has been taken out. They they pretty much cleared. They've got the mountains. They've got the lowlands. They've got Hebron. They've got the area of Benjamin. Okay? So now we're look at. Here's Akshav. Now this is northern Israel. Here's the Sea of Galilee here. Oh, cool. I didn't realize you could go full out on these and go to Google Maps. This Bible Hub is an excellent resource, you guys. So you see Hazor up here north of the Sea of Galilee. The next major city up is going to be Laish, which becomes Dan, okay? 
Um, but this is basically, this is going to be in Asher's territory. This is going to be in um, maybe Naphtali's territory. Um, the king of Shimron. Let's see where Shimron is. There's apparently another Bethlehem here. But that's going to be in Zebulun's territory, Shimron. So these are probably the major cities of the territories that become the capitals of the different tribes. And all who were north in the hill country in the Arabah, south of Shinaroth, in the land and the heights of Dor in the west, and the Canaanite on the east and the west, and the Amorite and the Hittite and the Parasite, oops, and the Parasite and the Jebusite in the hill country, and the Hivite at the foot of Hermon, so that's going to be north near the Golan. Hermon is going to kind of be near the Golan Heights. Uh, in the land of Mizpah. And they came out with all their armies with them and as many people as the sand and the seashore with very many horses and chariots, okay? So all this stuff from Jericho and AI and all this stuff, this has probably all happened within probably a month. It's happened pretty fast, okay? So these Jews come in and they do their march round thing for a week at Jericho and they take it out. And within a few weeks, they have cleared out all of southern Judah. So the Canaanites in the north are like, we need to get everybody because this basically they came in and took out Jericho and they're like, okay, this is bad. Obviously these Canaanites did not think these guys are coming in here to take the whole land of Canaan. Okay. When they took out Jericho, it was like crap. Everyone's kind of scared. And then they took out AI and everyone's like, well, AI is not that strong. And then they made a league with Gibeon and these guys are like, okay, if these guys come in and make a league with Gibeon, they could take out all of, um, lower, lower Canaan. And uh, so they all gather together those regional kings in Lower Canaan that come against them. But when they take out those kings, then everyone's like, get everybody, get everybody, okay? And they're probably getting Hittites from as far away as Turkey because the Hittites are the big empire at this time. They're like, get everybody because this is their base. This is from where the Hittites were able to project power into, um, into Turkey because they had all this trade with Egypt and Mesopotamia going on and their cousins, the Amorites, were controlling Mesopotamia. And so this, this nexus they have there, and this is why God's giving it to Israel, it's the nexus of trade between Egypt, the Hittite Empire, um, and the Babylonian Empire, and then to the north of them, you're going to have Mitanni or the Hyrian, Hyrians, um, which is basically your connection with the Japhethites, okay? The, the, um, Ash, the Syrians aren't really a big power yet, okay? So they it's pretty much the nexus of all world trade going on right now, okay? And it's got great farmland, and it's got seaports, and it's got everything they need to basically, it's their economic base from which they were able to run in and take over most of Turkey and most of Iraq and Syria, okay? that Those are the Amorites and the Hittites, okay? So now their base is under threat and they realize, oh crap, if they take that, we're falling apart. And that's exactly what they do, okay? It's not gonna be long after this that the Hittites collapse and the Amorites fall in Mesopotamia. And before they fall, they're gonna send their armies against Judah in the, in the Book of Judges and they're gonna oppress them for a while, okay? So then it says, then it came about when Jobin the king of Hazor heard it that he sent to Jobab the king of Madon. Okay, so we read all these things. And they came out to them, the armies, as many people as the sand that is on the seashore with very many horses and chariots. So they're coming from the north with chariots. And all these kings have agreed to meet and encamp together at Miram, which to fight against Israel. So Miram, remember it's the king of Hazor that got them. So here's Miram, where, well, this is Mount Miram. And so they think it's somewhere near her. So it's the king of Hazor. Um, and they're encamped up here, and they're going to fight against Israel. And I believe that they're going to fight um, in the Valley of Armageddon, because the Valley of Armageddon would be around here. The Gido's somewhere up in these mountains, and uh, the valley would be down here, okay? So they're probably camped up here. They're, they're like, this is Mount Miram. It's probably not here, but Miram is probably downhill from it somewhere around here. And... Um, and it's the king of Hazor that called them all together. So it's probably like that's their staging ground. And then they're going to go in and invade from here. And they're going to try to fight Israel. Okay. It's not going to not gonna work. It says that the Lord delivered them from the hand of Israel and defeated them and pursued them as far as great Sidon and 
Mizrafoth, Maine, in the Valley of Mizpah to the east, and they struck them until no survivor left them. So it doesn't really get into a lot of details about this battle. They just they just won. They just took them out. Um, Great Sidon, obviously, is going to be um, to the north um, where the Sidonians live, probably near Tyre. Who knows why it's called Great Sidon. Um, Joshua did to them as, as the Lord had told them, and he hamstrung their horses and burned their chariots with fire. Then the Lord turned back at that time and uh, captured uh, Hazor and struck its king with a sword. And um, Hazor formerly was the head of all these kingdoms. They struck every person. So it says, for Hazor formerly had been the head of all these kingdoms. So whoever the king of Hazor was, um, it was apparently in charge of all northern Israel. Okay. Um, they struck every person with the edge of the sword, utterly destroyed them. There's no one left who breathed, and he burned Hazor with fire. Joshua captured all the cities of these kings and their kings, and he struck them with the edge of the sword and utterly destroyed them, just as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded. However, Israel did not burn any of the cities that stood on their mounds except Hazor alone, which Joshua burned. So they're going to go claim all those cities. All the spoil of these cities and the cattle the sons of Israel took as their plunder, and they struck every man with the edge of the sword until they had destroyed them. They left no one who breathed. Okay, So they utterly genocided these cities and they're going to just take them and occupy them just as the lord commanded moses servant so moses commanded joshua and joshua did and left nothing undone of all the lord commanded moses thus joshua took all the land the hill country and all the negev and all the land of goshen the lowland the arabah the country of israel with its lowland from mount halak as it rises towards mount seir even to Belgad and the uh, valley of lebanon at the foot of mount hermon so Roughly what you see as Israel today, they took it all, okay? And struck them down and put them to death. And probably this has taken place, I would guess, in less than a year. That would be my guess. Joshua waged war a long time with these kings. So they, they, they're they going to keep fighting, but the main battles are probably done within a year. And But they're going to keep fighting and taking out these kings. And there was not a city which made peace with the sons of Israel except for the Hivites. So they were Hivites that lived in Gibeon. Um, and just so you know, the Hivites were also the people who Esau married in with, okay? And they took them in battle. The Hivites were also the people who were in Sodom and Gomorrah. You want to mark that down, okay? So guess what they like doing? For it was the of the Lord to harden their heart to meet in Israel in battle in order that they might utter, uh, utterly destroy them and they might receive mo no mercy, but that he might destroy them as long as uh, the Lord had commanded Moses. Then Joshua came from that time and cut off the Anakim from the hill country, from Hebron to Debir, from Anab and all the hill country of um, Judah, and from all the hill country of uh, Israel. And Joshua utterly destroyed them with their cities. And there was no Anakim left in the land of the sons of Israel, only in Gaza and Gath and in Ashdod some remained. So in the days of Joshua, and I think there's overlap between the days of Joshua and the book of Judges, okay? It's saying that they took out all the Anakim, but we're going to read stories in Judges about how they took out the Anakim, okay? So this is why you want to understand, like, Joshua is not a book that's like, okay, kind of like how Deuteronomy jumps right into Joshua. Joshua is telling what happened in the days of Joshua, and as a result of Joshua's campaigns, when you get into the book of Judges, it's going to start with... Um, Caleb and his brother and stuff like that, who's obviously with Joshua, and they're going to be some of the first judges. And basically, Joshua is. Um, it says he he. It says there were no Anakim left in the land, so this book was probably meant to be a standalone book. And then Judges came in as the second book, and there's just going to be overlap in the first. You you probably have, um, the first stories in the book of Judges probably take place. Um, maybe not while Joshua's alive, maybe around the time. Um, cause, because it's actually going to talk about Joshua, basically them not doing great after Joshua, um, stopped leading them. Um, so Joshua took the whole land according to the Lord had spoken to Moses and Moses gave it to an inheritance of Israel according to their divisions by their tribes, but the land had rest from war. So that's, we're in chapter 12 now. Now these are the kings of the land whom Israel defeated and the land whom they possessed beyond the Jordan before the sunrise in the valley of Arnon, as far as Mount Hermon to Arabah in the east. Sihon, king of the Amorites, who lived in Heshbon, who rode from Aror, and the edge of the valley of Arnon, in the middle of the valley of the half of Gilead, as far as the brook of Gabbok, is from the sons of Ammon. So I'm going to cruise through this stuff, because the reason is, is basically this is a verbal map, okay? What it's trying to tell you is this is the land of Israel, this is what they, we conquered, and this is what we divided up, okay? And so this is going to serve as a record 
and this probably went to the priesthood, um, which is why I think Samuel's one who's compiling this in Judges, okay? Um, it's going to serve as a record of whose land was what originally when we took all the land, and they're going to have the incomplete borders of land and all the cities that they took and which cities went to who, okay? And that's pretty much going to be the rest of Joshua. There's going to be 12 chapters of this, okay? So um, I don't know if I'm going to go through all of it today. It's a lot. I'm going to call that a wrap. Because what we have here... The rest of the book, which is like half the book, is just going to be a verbal map of the land. Who got what? Who all they conquered? Um what territory they're going to get and how that territory was divided up. And this is going to be very important to save for posterity in case there's any issues with whose land belongs to who between the Israelite tribes later on. Okay, so um, I'm going to probably just cruise you through that. And if there's anything interesting um, of note, then we're going to get into that next time. Um, but that's going to be my last section of Joshua. So that's just going to be the division of the land. Okay, um, that's kind of it for Joshua's campaigns. And then it's just going to be now Joshua's old. So the rest of this is going to be, again, the, the, these first battles probably take place within a year or so, and the rest of it is going to take place over like the last 20 years of Joshua's life, okay? Um, and like I said, it's going to bleed into the book of um, the book of Judges at several different points because Judges is not one big chronology. It's going to be several different stories, and it's going to be relatively historical, but there's going to be chunks of it that are not um chronological. So, um, we'll, we'll, we'll cruise through the rest of Joshua in one, in one setting. And then, um, we'll get into the book of judges after that. So hope you guys are blessed by this. Uh, remember use this Bible hub, use this map and figure out where you're going. Just enjoy learning about the whole journey and just understanding how they got this place. Cause they were very specific. Remember, this is not just going to be, you know, a story of how they kicked butt. This is telling what territory they had and who they gave it to, okay? So this is going to be basically be a historical, it's kind of describing the states of the union of Israel, okay? So I hope you guys are blessed by this. Hope you have a great rest of your week. Batman out. Peace. Peace, I'm out. I'm Batman.